um, can look up to and, and perhaps emulate and contact and reach out to as well. Uh, it's great to have a broad audience um, and people that come around um, to, to essentially um, in, engage and ask questions from our speakers about these, this area of medical innovation. So with that, I, I think we have a very special event today because we have a team uh, of both a physician and an engineer who are gonna be presenting on using engineering technologies to address this neurology care crisis. Uh, to, to make some introductions, so Dr. Chris Zellick is a neurologist at OSF uh, Healthcare and leads the Neural Health Lab at Jump Simulation in Peoria. Uh, he received his medical doctorate from the University of Iowa and completed then uh, neurology residency <clears throat> and neuromuscular disorders and EMG fellowship at the University of Michigan. <clears throat> Uh, complimenting then is Professor uh, Liz Sau Wexler. She's a professor and a Willett faculty scholar here uh, at the University of Illinois from the Department of Mechanical Science and Engineering. She's also an affiliate professor in Carl, Illinois and the Beckman Institute and in bioengineering as well. She's president elect of the American Society of Biomechanics and co-founder of IntelliWheels, um, a local startup which many of you might be familiar with as well. Uh, so with that, we very much look forward to, to to seeing and hearing about these experiences between um, what you may have seen as, as a physician, uh, as well as some of the engineering solutions to those problems. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so I'll go ahead and get started today. We're going to again, be talking about uh, how engineering technologies uh, can be leveraged to help deal with what's uh, becoming a growing neurology care crisis. Uh, first of all, I'd like to declare that we have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So our, uh, my objectives uh, for my section is we're going to talk a little bit about the neurological care problem and how it's a big problem. And then uh, just do an overview of the neurologic evaluation process. And then we're going to look at uh, potential opportunities for engineering to help uh, compensate for uh, this problem. I'd like to start with a, a video. Uh, this is a person who works here at OSF, and she's talking about her brother-in-law, who's 70 years old. He had been having symptoms for quite a while. About a year ago, my sister started noticing symptoms that were concerning to her. Um, she was thinking he might have Parkinson's. She noticed um, some gait issues. He was shuffling his feet, and he had a slight tremor that she hadn't noticed before. So she went with him to one of his primary care physician appointments and mentioned to his doctor, who he'd been seeing for quite a few years, um, her concerns and what the symptoms she was seeing were. And he um, did a workup and said that it was a rehab issue. So he prescribed physical therapy and the symptoms, most of them improved. Uh, the few that didn't, they just kind of chalked up to him getting older. Yeah, so that's uh, raises a, a big issue that our aging population faces is, you know, the, the changes that I have, am I getting older or is it the start of some sort of disease. With the Google and other online resources, people can start to figure out their diagnosis sooner, but it's uh, still, still an issue. So a year later, after he had had a fall and broke his hip and had to have surgery, he was having confusion afterwards. All the results were clear. The doctor said he just really didn't know what it was. Uh, he wanted them to see a neurologist to follow up at that point, but he said it was definitely not Parkinson's disease and definitely not Alzheimer's. So he didn't know what it was, but referred them to a neurologist. And a couple of weeks later, they were able to get into a neurologist. And on the first appointment, she diagnosed him with Parkinson's disease. And so this is a, a very common experience that's happening across the United States. And it, it shows several different uh, issues with our current way that we deliver neurologic care. Uh, one surprising thing in this video was that they were able to see a neurologist within two weeks. They just uh, had a neurologist move to their town and was just starting up their uh, clinic. But uh, normally the average weight uh, for a non-emergency patient to be seen by a neurologist is five to six business weeks. And so a super long time. They got in in two weeks. That was surprising. So again, we, we have this big problem. We have an increasing number of patients. We have more people every year, just size-wise of our population, but also there's a growing uh, baby boomer aging population. Older you are, uh, more likely it is you're gonna have a neurologic condition. Neurologic conditions affect one in three uh, people. And so it, it's a lot of people having different problems uh, within neurology. 
Uh, it's the second leading cause of death when you look at all the different combined neurologic conditions. But the more important thing is, is that it's the leading cause of lost quality of life, of suffering, uh, pain. And that's the big thing that needs to be addressed. When neurologic conditions impair who we can be as people and what we want to do. And uh, it's, it's a very important, hard thing to address. Uh, though we have this increasing population, we're having fewer and fewer neurologists overall to care for them. And so by the year 2025, it's projected that the neurology shortage in the United States alone will be 19%. We already have a lot of areas with neurology deserts. Neurologists like to be around academic centers and major metropolitan centers. Uh, there are even greater shortages elsewhere in the world. So a lot of people need care, but we don't have enough neurologists. For the people that end up having to care for these patients, the non-neurologists, the primary clinicians, a lot of them have neurophobia and they can't keep track of everything going on in neurology. So they have a not knowing or being aware of what's happening in neurology. And, and this uh, increased costs and uh, also reduces the quality of care. Um, for neurophobia, uh, it's started clear, uh, it's been going on for a long time. It was first described in 1994 by a teaching neurology specialist out of Buffalo. And uh, since then they've been studying this and they've identified major factors for this, which is the complexity of the neuroanatomy, that there is poor teaching, uh, reduce patient exposures, you know, what kind of conditions you see are based upon where you are and what clinic you're in, and you don't get to see the, the breadth of neurology. And then there are the complexities of the neurologic examination. All of those things are identified by both students and clinicians as things that make them uncomfortable with neurology. And it's not just that non-neurologists are uncomfortable with neurology, but as neurosciences and neurology has expanded, a lot of neurologists are subspecializing in the stroke, multiple sclerosis, dementia, neuromuscular disorders, seizures, and we lose the ability to keep track as well of all the other changes that are happening in other parts of neurology. And this leads to neurophobia even amongst neurologists. So I want to talk a little bit about the neurologic process, and uh, some of the people here are students online and other people are practicing clinicians. Um, I just want to give a big uh, general overview of this, but the two main questions we have to answer are where is the lesion and what is the lesion? So where are the symptoms coming from and what are causing the symptoms? And we go through a process uh, on this to try to map this out of where is the lesion. You can kind of imagine neurologists as a manager of a very busy train station that has trains coming in from different directions and going out to different directions. And you get used to seeing patterns of knowing when these trains are coming in and which people should be on the trains and when the train should be leaving and which people should be getting on what trains. And if there's a change in the pattern, you know that somewhere upline or downline, there's some sort of issue and kind of map that out. And that's, that's what we try to do. Uh, based on the timing of the symptoms and the characteristics, then we can get a general category of what could be possibly causing those problems. So that's, that's our challenge. Uh, we have big complex neuroanatomy maps, but overall that can be reduced to this uh, generalization of segments within the, the nervous system. So we have the brain itself and then things funnel through the brain stem, which includes the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla, the cerebellums in the back there too. Uh, but you have brain, brain stem, spinal cord, nerve root, plexus, individual nerve, neuromuscular junction, and then muscle. And for sensory, you have a the pathway coming up. That, those are the, the main areas that we need to deal with when somebody comes in and reports that they're having a symptom. And so, uh, we have lots of different, more complex uh, maps, but to get us in the ballpark, so to speak, these are the regions uh, that you can uh, distill things to. So for the neurologic evaluation, the biggest thing is history. It, it should get us towards the right diagnosis about 85% of the time. And then what we wanna do as we're asking questions and uh, 
uh, trying to clarify this a little bit more is start to figure out what type of exam techniques do we want to do to test our hypotheses. And uh, subsequently then we narrow it down a little bit more and we may need additional diagnostic testing. Uh, just a little shout out to the Beckman Center over there uh, for the students who have not been over to the Beckman Center yet. Uh, very fortunate, it's an uh, incredible imaging center there. And uh, one of the original human MRIs is now on display. Uh, this is from when the MRI was uh, in the basement, but they've sent, since uh, set up a display. And uh, it just shows the amazing progress uh, that uh, medical technology and the engineers have made. Uh, and uh, this, this tool has made a, a big impact uh, on healthcare worldwide. Uh, so diagnostic testing is important and it'll continue to progress. One thing that you need to know though is where are you gonna point this camera? And so again, history, 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 and exam are most important to figure out then what the diagnostic testing is. There's, uh, there are more dollars spent now on MRIs and other testing that are spent on uh, neurology salaries in the United States at this point. And uh, it's, when they look at that data, there are a lot of tests that aren't being done uh, at an appropriate level. And so it's, it's very important, again, to start with history and exam and do focused testing. So eventually you establish the diagnosis and then you come up with a treatment plan and how are you gonna track the patient, determine if your treatments are making a difference and what are their outcomes? That's, that's the neurologic evaluation process. For the neurologic exam itself, we, we clump it into some different groups also. Again, this looks at different regions uh, of the nervous system. And so uh, mental status, you're gonna be dealing with the cerebral hemispheres. You have the cranial nerves. Uh, I didn't uh, put in the olfactory nerve, but uh, one through 12, uh, they plug into either the brain or the brain stem and uh, deal with various uh, functions with uh, vision, uh, our face, our hearing and balance, and speaking and swallowing. And then uh, motor strength, bulk and tone, uh, if a person has weakness, you know, let's say they can't move their right foot. We're looking at the patient here. You have to think of the entire pathway. So is it a problem with the muscle that's supposed to move the foot, the nerve talking to the muscle, or uh, going all the way up through the plexus, the nerve root into the spinal cord, brainstem, or contralateral hemisphere? Um, thinking of that entire pathway helps you to narrow down where it could be the lesion and then with the story, what it could be. Uh, strength. Loss can be caused by a problem anywhere in this pathway, but if you have a decrease in bulk, the problem must be somewhere at where the nerve root plugs in to the uh, anterior horn cells and spinal cord or all the way out to the muscle. Uh, if there's an increase in tone, it's a problem somewhere in the spinal cord or in the brain stem or higher up to the brain. If it's a problem with decreased tone on your exam, you see a problem from uh, the nerve root out. Uh, and then reflexes, it's sort of the same process. So if reflexes are too jumpy, it's a problem in the spinal cord and rostrally. And if the reflexes are decreased, it's a problem with the nerve root, anterior horn cell, and distal. Uh, so th these are all different types of uh, general exam systems that we look at to look at the, the overall localization challenge. Uh, this is a uh, a um, video of a screening visualized neurologic examination. So a lot of what we do on our exam, we can see with our eyes. And our most important thing is asking questions and listening to the patient getting a great history. But then while that's happening, we can learn a lot of things just by looking at the patient. And I'll describe some of these things uh, as we go through this. So just looking now, uh, my eyes are lined up. Uh, the pupil sizes are symmetric. When they move left and right, everything appears lined up. Looking down up. The wrinkles on the forehead are symmetric. The nasal labial fold are relatively symmetric. And when I activate even further, it appears the same. I'm going to step back and do what's called pronator drift testing. And these hands should stay about the same. If you look very closely, I have a little bit of a tremor here. Uh, you can see it if you slow it down, if you didn't check this. This is finger tapping, and uh, this is a challenge for the motor system. Uh, in the pyramidal system. Now I'm checking coordination. Should it have a straight line going from finger to nose? 
Now I'll go ahead and check the other side. Uh, there are some conditions that affect both sides symmetrically, but uh, looking for symmetry of function is very important in looking at a person's neurologic examination. The frequency at which I'm rotating this and the amplitude is important. If one satellite's around the other, that could be a sign of a problem. Standing up shows uh, strength with the legs. And then looking at walking is balance, uh, sensation, coordination, looking at stride length, arm swing, and then finally standing. So we get a, a lot of information just from that that we can look at the, the brain, the brain stem, spinal cord, nerve roots, plexus, individual nerves, uh, and muscles just from doing that. There are some things though that we have to do hands-on in addition. So we can get some sense of strength just uh, observing the patient, but sometimes you have to test individual muscles. And um, this is checking bicep strength here. Sometimes people have a, a nerve root problem or an individual nerve problem uh, that just affects the nerves going to elbow flexion and you need to test this. Uh, Liz will talk about this a little bit uh, later with a simulator, but uh, this person for technique, the hand is on the wrong shoulder. They should be stabilizing this joint to isolate this better. And they're not getting optimal mechanical leverage here. So this isn't really a good strength uh, exam here. Uh, muscle tone, you have to have the person relax their muscles completely, kind of go limp like a rag doll for whatever limb you're examining. And then you passively move the arm and there's a, a certain amount of resistance just from uh, inertia and in the connective tissue, but uh, this is something that uh, has to be learned and uh, it can be either increased or decreased. Uh, tapping on reflexes, if they're brisk, it could be a problem in the spinal cord or uh, above. And if they're decreased, it's a problem at the anterior horn cell or out or a problem with the uh, sensory system. Uh, one thing about this, uh, discussing quality of neurology exams is this is a tomahawk hammer. Most of these are super light. Uh, they previously were given out by drug reps. I don't know if they do that anymore, but uh, if they're too light, you don't get enough kinetic energy to actually uh, move the tendon, which stretches the muscle to cause the muscle stretch reflex. So you can easily get brisk reflexes with one of these hammers, but you can't get a uh, hypoactive but present reflex with too light of a hammer. So for the, the med students, make sure you have the right equipment uh, when you examine your patients. Uh, also checking sensation, uh, light touch, pinprick. Uh, those are things that are hands-on information that are at times needed. It's not that everybody needs every part of the neurologic examination. You wanna do a focused exam that uh, does a screening uh, exam, but then also test your hypotheses of what you're looking for. So neuro exam consisting, we got into that a little bit. Uh, availability, we have the shortage of neurologists, shortage of caregivers. So are exams available for people who are having neurologic symptoms? And then are they performed well? Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Yeah, even if they're performed well, are they interpreted correctly? So you know, people can detect, oh yes, there's, there's a problem here, but does that mean it's coming from the brain or is it coming from the brain stem, the spinal cord or somewhere else? How are we gonna interpret those results? And on top of that, the clinicians are super busy and how well are they going to document their information so that when they themselves review it the next time, it makes sense to them and they can tell if there's been a change or if somebody else has to care for the patient in the future is what's documented actually what's happening with the patient. And those are all big challenges for our system right now. So I'll switch gears. We talked a little bit about neuroevaluation and that's the analog human way to do it. Uh, but uh, the neat thing that's coming about now is that with uh, engineering, uh, scientists and uh, computer specialists, uh, scientists are developing different sensors and different algorithms to digitize and quantify most portions uh, of the neurologic examination. And on these columns on the left, I've just written down uh, some of the sensors that can be used for the different portions of the neurologic examination. And I'll go ahead and give some examples of these. Um, so Winterlight is a company uh, out of Canada in Israel where they're using natural language processing and uh, training machines to look at language patterns. 
And based on what kind of pauses are occurring, if a person is substituting a very specific word for a generic word uh, and uh, multiple other factors to estimate a mini mental state uh, exam score. And so a mini mental state exam score, we go through a checklist of different questions uh, and based on their score zero to 30, you can kind of say, well, it's normal, mild cognitive impairment or there's severe cognitive impairment. Uh, this algorithm, this company keeps getting the algorithm better and better and uh, they're able to uh, estimate quite closely uh, in, in their studies uh, in MMSE. So in, in the future, you can imagine having a screening test just where your phone or your smart speaker at home every once in a while just pays attention to how you're talking and detecting changes over time to determine if you need to see your uh, clinician about whether or not you're getting uh, the early signs of dementia. Uh, looking at the fundus in the past, we'd have to use the ophthalmoscope uh, and we would just see a little portion uh, of the retina at any one time. But uh, now with lenses and technology, you can look at pretty much the entire fundus all at once and you can take photographs of them. With very specialized cameras, you can get very detailed information to the point now where uh, they're using uh, machine learning uh, to figure out what are pattern changes that are associated with some medical conditions. And even uh, there was one paper they talked about being able to identify the gender of a person uh, with, I think, a, a 90% or 85% uh, confidence uh, just based on what their retina looks like. So it's uh, very, very neat technology coming about. Uh, pupillometry in the past, we look at the person's pupils and say, oh, five millimeters, six millimeters, shine a light in them, and then try to figure out if they're constricting appropriately or not. And uh, this is now being uh, digitized and quantified. There are a couple different companies uh, that are doing this. Uh, this sequence uh, earlier in the film showed a more dilated set of pupils. And then in the later uh, portion of the video, they're more constricted. So it's showing that uh, one eye does not detect light as well compared to the other, even though the pupils are equal. Uh, this is an afferent pupillary defect. Uh, eye movements, you know, we look at the person looking left, right, up, down, and say, yeah, that's normal, or they're not lined up, but oftentimes we can't describe it uh, much better than that. Back in the 70s, they started quantifying eye movements with scleral coils. So they have these coils, and they have magnetic fields around the coils, and you move your eyes, you set up uh, currents, and they were able to map out the person's eye movements. It's very invasive. You can only do it for about uh, 30 minutes at most. And so uh, subsequently technology has evolved to where they're using uh, infrared lights and the reflection of the lights in relation to the pupil and they can track eye movements. And not just tracking eye movements uh, to see how well they do, but you can challenge the person with moving their head and they have uh, IMUs or movement sensors in these glasses also to keep track of is that movement an appropriate response. So if, I, if I'm trying to focus on the camera here and somebody turns my head rapidly, my eye should automatically correct sensing that movement uh, of my inner ear fluid. And uh, this is a, a way to go about doing that. Uh, those uh, goggles, they work great and uh, they're still not as good as scleral coils, but they're a vast improvement. But the thing is, you know, getting goggles to a lot of different places and getting people trained to use them correctly uh, is hard and it's expensive. And uh, so a, a team from Johns Hopkins is trying to get a similar function just into people's iPhones. So if you uh, go into an ER, or even potentially at home, you can have a similar type of testing without the, the specialized goggles. And so what this uh, app does is it keeps track of the head movement and maps it, and there should be an opposite uh, but equal gain of eye movement in the other direction, keep the eyes locked on target. So you'll see that here. And these colors here are showing uh, head movement one direction, eye movements the other. And uh, when they 
have this uh, better validated and rolled out clinically, this will make a, a huge difference for evaluating uh, patients who come into the ER with dizziness with possible stroke uh, with eye movement abnormalities. And uh, we're very excited to see that. Uh, they have, they've had automated hearing for an extended time, uh, even can go into the home now. Uh, this is just an example of phonation. And uh, with this, uh, they're just looking at what the words sound like if you have a banana in the person's mouth and nothing in the person's mouth versus potato chip and how it alters the frequency of sounds. And those alterations in sound can also be heard in patients who have spasticity. So you talk like you're having a lot of difficulty with your vocal cords, not being relaxed. Uh, machines can help detect that and quantify that. Uh, Liz will talk about looking at muscle tone coming up. Uh, this is just a quick little video of using RGB camera. Uh, this is with a couple of graduate students uh, at UIUC, just uh, mapping out a simulated ataxia or difficulty in pointing fingers together. And you can see this track out uh, where it's not nice and symmetric and equal on target. Uh, you can also now, instead of just using Kinect cameras or the markers, they're starting to develop uh, pose estimation techniques to do motion capture and uh, gradually get these better and better to try to figure out what's a, a way to look at walking and determine are, are there changes in a person's walking and what kind of features point towards one condition versus another. So uh, just a, a quick little side note. So I went through all these examples of how you can digitize and quantify the exam. And it's, it's leading to another problem. In the past, uh, we wrote down all of our findings by hand and it was just what we're interpreting. And one of the doctors I worked with, he said, you look at the descriptions and they don't help you very much. But then the problem with digital charting is we're getting all these data streams and we don't know what to do with it. So are we just collecting data or is it going to actually change outcomes? And that's one of the, the challenges that's going to happen uh, here. So for clinical decision support, all this data that gets generated, uh, you know, you got to be able to do something with it. It's got to be uh, able to be applied to a specific person. And then your, your AI behind it, uh, machine learning, uh, clinical decision support has to be strong. But again, if you can't incorporate them into workflows or if they don't change a person's outcome, they're not going to be adopted. So you can have the coolest technology in the world, but uh, it's got to work in the clinic too. Uh, future dream state, you know, we're going to have e-devices uh, following us and being able to measure some of our exams. We're going to have chatbots uh, and genomics are all going to combine together to kind of look at our trajectories and what, what's our health doing. And if something starts to deviate off of that, even before we become symptomatic, we may be notified by our devices, to go get checked out. In the end though, uh, we have to have this team of the patients and the clinician. And you know, we have a long ways to go to get to this technology. And the most important thing uh, are the clinicians caring for the patients. So uh, we need to train those people to get better, to get away from neurophobia and uh, enhance training with different opportunities. And in the past, people have talked about teaching is poor, we don't have enough patients to look at and the examinations are too complex. How can we get more experience uh, for the students? And that's, that's where simulation comes about. And this, this is what Liz will talk about now. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. I think that really set the stage and presented some really interesting technologies too. I think we're gonna make a switch over here to uh, the next PowerPoint. And just a reminder for the audience, please feel free to enter your questions in the chat as they come to mind. And uh, we'll get to those at the end of the presentations as well as just open it up for, for anyone to ask questions. Okay, so hopefully you all can hear me. Um, yeah. 
Right, so in the second part of the talk, what Kristen, we're going to talk, well, what I'm going to talk about here are a number of these training simulators that Chris has been working on along with me um, to address some of the, the, the needs for improvement in um, training of individuals to doing the physical assessments during these neurological exams. So we're going to focus on four different training simulators that we've been working on. Um, relating to assessing muscle weakness, uh, spasticity, rigidity, and then clonus. And then he quickly talked about a measurement device that we've also had to create as a consequence of trying to create these training simulators. You need data in order to program them and for what are the resistance, what's the, the magnitudes of the resistance and the behaviors that we're trying to replicate. And and people were asking, are there quantitative data in the, the chat? I saw that. And this is part of our, our thoughts that actually, if we can get quantitative data, maybe we don't have to do some of these qualitative scales. So what am I talking about? In the clinical evaluations, the focus, as I just said, we're looking at abnormal neuromuscular behaviors that are assessed during passive movements. Um, so, you know, and we see over here in the right hand side a, a typical physical therapy training session where you've got about 20 students looking either at a standardized patient or um, an actual patient that's come in and you're trying to evaluate that uh, individual especially issues like spasticity the more the muscle is uh, being flexed and extended the behavior may be different from uh, one student to the next student. So can we be able to address these issues by creating standardized training simulators uh, to look at these behaviors? So let me quickly talk about spasticity and rigidity in case you don't really know those too well. Spasticity often happen, is observed with patients to post-stroke with cerebral palsy or MS. This particular behavior is you see an increased amount of resistance as you're passively trying to move the joint. Um, but one of the interesting pieces of it, it's velocity dependent. So the faster you move the joint, you actually will feel that resistance, the slower that you won't. Rigidity on the other hand, um, is independent of the speed or the position in the range of motion, but you just see, feel a constant increased resistance throughout that behavior. I'll cover each of these in a little more uh, as I talk about the different training simulators. Okay, so as I sort of said, and I'm, I'm sorry, I have a feeling the videos that you're going to watch may be very jumpy and are not going to be necessarily clear. Uh, because during these passive range of motion, some of these behaviors happen really quickly and because of the bandwidth of, of the the video uh, on Zoom, um, you may miss some of the behaviors. Uh, so typically uh, the clinicians will be using these qualitative scales to assess the individual's um, uh, rating, right? So on the left-hand side, uh, Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating System of the UPDRS. In the motor section of it, they're assessing rigidity. And you can sort of see how these different scales go from a zero sort of uh, normative behavior. There's no rigidity. And then these qualitative differences. Well, a one is it's a slight rigidity, you know, and then not, two is a mild rigidity, <laughs> and three is marked. But what does that really mean? And as learners are trying to identify how to grade these people. On the right-hand side is a similar scale, that's the Ashworth scale, or now the modified Mo Ashworth, or even the modified modified Ashworth, um, trying to, again, how do you categorize a patient? And depending on what your training was, how, how much you've experienced, that your scaling might be different than another person's scaling, and which could be a big problem if you're you're comparing charts and uh, going from one institution to another institution or the patient has moved. Is it the patient actually improving or, or uh, becoming more uh, impaired over time? But could it also just be a consequence of the individual's training? So um, 
Let's talk about, we're going to cover the first training simulator. So this particular one is trying to just assess strength. So this is when the clinician is asking for isometric strength, just hold your arms tight and try not to let me break, you know, break your flexion or extension, right? In order to create this, there's a, a concern that young clinicians or early clinicians may not actually apply enough uh, resistive force to, to break that um, behavior of the patient. So in this simulator, which is first done by a senior design team at UIUC in the bioengineering program, they had a year long project. Uh, they were posed with normal, normal 60 year old individual takes about 47 pounds of force by the clinician in order to sort of break that isometric flexion. However, uh, a weak case, uh, if the, the patient were weak, you could be able to exceed a load of maybe 35 pounds so you're pulling in order to get this motion. So what this simulator is trying to do um, using what's called a pneumatic muscle or a McKibben muscle. And just like a real muscle, when you activate it, or in this case, pressurize it with a foot pump, the muscle will contract and create force. And, in the, and so it was designed such that if a clinician is applying greater than a 35 pound load, then the flexion, uh, isometric flexion would be broken and the joint would start moving. If the clinician does not exceed that amount, then it just stays in an isometric flexion position. Um, and then the, you could see through a load cell and a visual output of how much load was actually applied to the wrist joint. Um, Salvatore, who's actually shown here, he was a, a medical fellow at the Jump Simulation Center working with Chris. And he did another study uh, at um, UA Comp. And he looked at 33 medical students, 19 uh, practicing clinicians, five residents, and, and three additional people. And in this particular study, they did three different trials. One where they uh, had the device set for weak settings, so it would break at 35 pounds or higher. They didn't really give them a lot of instructions on where to, um, uh, how to do it, except that there was a written description, like you should place your hand in an appropriate location and then apply a load and try to break the flexion. In the second one, they changed the setting to the normal setting. So that means that you have to, you really wouldn't be able to break it. And in this particular case, the way they were preventing um, flexion was by literally locking out the joint. And they had a mechanical hard stop that you just could not go beyond. In the third trial, this is after they said, okay, we want you to place your hand here with little, and being able to provide enough resistance to try to break and see if you can make a difference. Okay. Um, another qualitative scale that is used to assess uh, strength, as you can see, is the MRC, the Medical Research Council scale um, from zero to five. It's reverse of the other scales. So actually normative behavior is a high number um, and the more severe is a lower number. The results they found that between the first and the third trial, uh, they were able to correctly identify the, the score for uh, the week, two weeks set scales. Um, they correctly positioned their hand uh, in both the wrist and on the shoulder. And they were able to actually break um, the, the isometric flexion. And then there was some uh, qualitative evaluations of how well that these three different categories felt that the device um, worked. And they're pretty close to agreeing that they were very happy with the device. However, there were some issues. 
with the first generation device. So currently, uh, Chris and I are advising another senior design team. These are mechanical engineering students uh, that have been working this semester and they'll continue into the fall um, to try to address some of the limitations. So device design is always an iterative process. So here we're showing an example about being able to continue repeating. Um, so with the healthy condition or the normative condition, there was a sort of visual cue that you mechanically have to lock the device. There was also a little bit of um, uh, slack as a consequence of the pneumatic muscle. So you wouldn't hit the resistance right away when moving it. Uh, there was a problem with how the load cell was placed into the wrist. So the force measurements were not accurate. And there's some of these other things. It, these, so this particular team is now taking more of a robotics approach to mechatronics. They're using a motor with some gears and microcontrollers in order to create that same behavior that the pneumatic muscle was doing. With regards to spasticity, as I said, this other behavior we're trying to look at, it, as it has a speed dependency. So as you see from going uh, at a low speed, you have very little muscle resistance. At a higher speed, you have a greater amount of resistance. The behaviors of spasticity that are, are typically seen are what's called a catch and release behavior. So at some point during the range of motion, you will have a sharp increase in the amount of resistance that you are feeling. Uh, so this is a sort of catch behavior. And then it starts decreasing over uh, through the range of motion, or in this case, time. Uh, so this is the release behavior. Additionally, if, as we see here, as you have a higher MAS level versus a lower MAS level, the total range of motion that the patient is able to experience has decreased. As a consequence of this, we try to develop a training simulator specifically for spasticity, and we wanted to do it without needing any electronics. So we noticed that uh, spasticity is a velocity dependent resistant behavior. So as engineers that geek out, we said, well, what, what has a increase in force as a consequence of speed or the velocity you move? And that would be a damper behavior. And a hydraulic damper just means that we've got liquid in a damper where a piston is being pulled through. So um, this was... Uh, also being done with Steve Tepe, who is a, um, the head of physical therapy at Bradley in Peoria. Randy Ewell, a faculty in mechanical engineering who specializes in, in fluids, and Carrie and Enon, who is two graduate students. So I hope you'll be able to see these. They're, so there are three main components of the spasticity we're trying to deal with. Increased resistance, change of range of motion, and also uh, the catch and release and when it happens. So in order to do the resistance, as I said, this is a damper. So there's a piston that's being pulled through the area. Uh, and we are able to create different size holes in the piston heads. And we could expose smaller or larger holes, which would allow the fluid to flow through faster or slower. Um, through mechanical linkage at the elbow, we are able to pull this piston through at different times in the range of motion. Uh, and then we were also able to limit the amount of range of motion uh, through mechanical stops. So here we see, hopefully, you see a video at a lower level MAS first, MAS one. So there's very little bit of resistance. Um, so if you can also look at this plot in the blue MAS one, you have um, MAS zero. There's no resistance throughout the range of motion as you um, um, go up in severity. We chose that there's very little resistance, but it was also late in the range of motion. And then MAS3 is that you are increasing the amount of resistance, but it also happens much earlier in the range of motion, and the total range of motion is much reduced. And so the device was able to show the differences and also the difference as an effect of stretch speed. We had some clinicians in Peoria evaluate the device uh, to try to understand how they felt. We had what we call a blind assessment, again, where they did not know what the MAS levels were set for the device and asked them what did they think. Uh, 
the setting should be based on their uh, experience. And then we told them what it was and we asked them how realistic did they feel that um, the device operated. And so we had fairly good uh, matching between the blind assessment and what was the actual value and what they thought it was. And then in terms of realism, they said it's fairly close to what we have. And right now, this device is at Peoria. Uh, and the medical students are um, starting to uh, uh, try to utilize it and residents. OK. And then the next device is lead pipe rigidity. So as I said, lead pipe rigidity is just constant increased tone over the range of motion. There's not much of a change in the uh, total range of motion, and you do not see this uh, catch and release behavior as much. And so this particular is another group of graduate students and undergraduates that have been working on this design. And what we try to do in this design is get away from the passive uh, hydraulic design, and we decided to go with a robot. Um, in this, we use what's called a series elastic actuator or an SEA in order to provide the amount of force. Uh, the series elastic actuator, which is meaning you kind of put a spring design into um, the creating the amount of resistance. Uh, and it also gives a little, it provides a little give uh, in the robot itself. Um, Again, hopefully you're able to see this. In this example, EPR DRS zero, there's very little resistance. He could move it with like, very quickly. And at the higher resistance level, UPDRS three, he's needing to apply a much greater amount of load in order to, to generate the force. We don't, uh, unlike the spasticity, there's no catch and release, and there's no change in the range of motion in this simulator. We're planning to do some evaluations in Peoria with clinicians this coming summer. Um, the last training simulator that we've been working on is a clonus simulator. I really do not know if you'll be able to view this video, but the clonus is a very tricky behavior to try to elicit. If you could see the video, what you will see is a rhythmic uh, contractions or beating of the patient's uh, foot and ankle as a consequence of an applied external load. But what's really important is it has to be, this load has to be applied sort of at the right spot with the right speed and sustaining that load for a right amount of time in order to get this continuous um, beating behavior. Uh, this project was uh, funded by a joint work between Zhejiang University and the College of Engineering here. So we see a number of faculty and graduate students from both institutions. Similarly to the series elastic actuator device design of the rigidity training simulator, we're doing it also in the lower leg. Um, got a, a motor that drives a mechanical linkage, and then we have our slider crank mechanism that's sort of in the foot that dictates the amount of resistance that you get as a consequence of changing the uh, position of, or the amount of compression of the spring, we can change the amount of uh, resistance force that the clinician feels. And here we're able to put it either in a seated, seated or supine configuration, which a clinician may often do. And we had a number of sensors in order to be able to assess, does the clinician place their hands in the proper uh, spot? Are they applying the uh, uh, appropriate rotation and speed um, to be able to elicit the behavior? So if these videos were to work, you could see three different behaviors that the device can do. If you do not uh, apply a rapid enough um, angular velocity or do not apply the right amount of applied torque, you will not get any beating or clonus behavior. So this is what would happen in the first left-hand side. If you drop the, if you do, are you able to apply the load and fast enough and at a high enough uh, torque, but you drop it 
too soon, the feeding behavior will stop. So it's not sustained. If you're able to do all of that and keep it uh, the applied load for a substantial amount of time, just like the real clinician does, then you'll be able to see this feeding behavior for a sustained period. Okay, and we were able to uh, actually test 17 physicians and physical therapists in China with the device this past summer over two different days in two different configurations and see if they were able to um, elicit clonus and a sustained clonus. So we, there's a, some behaviors that we see uh, that two, some of the clinicians were very successful. And then we also see examples of clinicians that were not successful at eliciting the behavior. And one of the things that we were able to do over the two-day period is the first group provided some feedback about how realistic or not realistic the device was. So on the second day with a new set of uh, clinicians, we had changed some of the control parameters and um, actually improved the scores in terms of how the clinicians felt of the realism of the device. Finally, as I mentioned, uh, we realized that we needed to know more about the range of motion or the position, the velocity at which you're moving the joint, and the amount of resistance that the clinician is feeling while performing a number of these passive uh, flexion and extension behaviors. So we ended up creating what we call the PVRM or the position velocity resistance meter. It utilizes IMUs or inertial measurement units in um, the forearm, well, in two body segments. Uh, so you could have one on a moving segment and then another on a stationary segment, um, being able to use some EMG to verify that the muscle of interests are passive and not being activated during the behavior and being able to capture all that. So the idea here is being able to put the PBRM and it could be on any joint here we're just looking at it at the elbow joint. Uh, ideally, we may be able to capture some patient information. From the PVRM, we can capture information about the velocity, position, and the resistance as a consequence of the clinician moving the joint. And then from this, also being able to get some key parameters, such as range of motion, when the catch happens, what's the speeds, what's the resistance. And then from this, being able to actually classify using some machine learning, ah, what would these behaviors be characterized as? And ultimately, we might be able to use this to track the behavior of the patient uh, over time. They provide actual quantitative data instead of qualitative scores. And we did this with a small subset of spasticity, rigidity, and control subject to allow us to collect some of the data, uh, the quantitative data that we were able to program the device with. So that's the conclusion of our talk. And feel free to contact us. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor Sal Wexler. And uh, Dr. Zellick as well. I think this is a nice example of, again, the clinical medical conditions, problems, and you know, engineering solutions to this. So we've got a number of questions that people have been posting in the chat, and I can go through, let me go back to the start of those, and we could I'll read some of those, and then we can open it up for the, the broader audience. So um, some just positive comments about people excited about this work. Uh, so there was a question, you mentioned some symptoms like confusion, how confusion may appear and, and disappear. And are there physical symptoms like strength and reflexes that also appear and disappear over time? And can those be quantified? Uh, there are some conditions that can cause fluctuations in a person's strength. Myasthenia gravis is an example, an autoimmune condition that uh, affects the transmission uh, at the neuromuscular junction, they, they can have fluctuating weakness. Okay. Um, I think you answered some of the, my questions and that was how qualitative versus quantitative the neuro exam is and, and how could these cameras, 
and sensors be used. Uh, Dr. Zedlock, I think you you created you showed a table that for all the different cranial nerves, there were different cameras and sensors that could be used. Um, how complete is that? So is it possible to do a, a thorough neuro exam purely over like telehealth? Uh, that's uh, if the frame rate is good enough, uh, you might start be able to uh, do that. I, you can get a lot of stuff visually, and I, I don't think it's been directly studied yet. It's it's uh, it would be an ideal thing is to pull together a lot of these technologies into one room. It would be very uh, archaic initially with all the different uh, things there, but just start practicing with that. But that's that's where things will go eventually. Okay. Uh, a question from uh, Gregory here. So uh, can these, these technologies, these sensors also be used to categorize different types of tremors? Uh, yes, uh, they, they would be able to determine if it's a resting tremor uh, or an action tremor or what's called a reemergent tremor where the person initially is stable and then after eight, 10 seconds, they start to get a tremor. You would be able to do that. You'd have to train the algorithms to recognize those features and classify them different directions. Hmm. Okay, very good. Um, I had a question. You, you talked about the voice app and how it's gonna actually break this down into identifying the words and, and, uh, and, and the tone, the cadence, the, uh, the patterns. Um, but there's also age-related changes in, in someone's speech. And how, are those subtle enough that you could still distinguish disease-related changes from sort of age-related changes? Uh, if you give the, the scientists en enough data, I think eventually they'll be able to uh, figure out what your normal trajectory is. And then if you deviate away from that, uh, that will raise a flag. And whether or not they can categorize what it is at that time, it, it may not be the case, but uh, th there was a study, uh, I think in 2018 or 17, where they distinguished uh, changes in speech patterns and language patterns of people who have Parkinson's, the regular Parkinson's, idiopathic Parkinson's versus variants of Parkinson's based on language and speech changes, which hmm. you know, it, it had to be pretty uh, detailed to be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing technology in, in a smartphone. <laughs> um, let's see, I think Jessica asked, are there centralized databases storing so much of this data that, that researchers can you know, pull from and work on? Uh, the healthcare engineering systems uh, center might be able to better answer that for you. There are data pools that are publicly available and uh, that is everyone's ideal state is that individual healthcare systems collect data for their patients to care for them, but then de-identify, anonymize it and make it available for the rest of the healthcare systems to make everyone's care better. And so it, uh, there are some healthcare systems that already do that. And there are some research teams that when they do these studies, they put the data out there and say, anybody else who can improve upon what we're already doing, feel free. Hmm. Okay. Although I'd like to add to that though, sure. that the data, at least for the topics that we've been looking at are very slim. And this is why we put the PBRM because in the literature, there really isn't a lot of information about uh, spasticity, rigidity, and clonus it, as to what are these thresholds and what are these values that one typically thinks about. And there's also conflicting data from different groups of based on the type of measurements that they use, the devices that they're using. Uh, so it isn't, I say with regards to some of these quantitative data, it's, it's not as ex extensive as we'd hope it would be. Probably a lot of variables and conditions and yeah. Yeah. Even, and the, the, even the technologies are, are right. different. And so, you know, are you, is it apples and apples or not? Yeah. Right. And I think also it's just people have not been thinking about quantitatively characterizing these, got these qualitative scales, mm -hmm. but not really correlating those numbers with numbers. 
<laughs> such yeah. that us, as engineers, we can use them to program and design something. We were, that's where we were lacking numbers to be able to design these things. Yeah, that's always been my general advice to, to our medical students is, is just, you know, observe and, and make something that's previously qualitative and, and make it quantitative. And, uh, and that alone, I think you could really be able to, uh, you know, to make some advances in the care. I, uh, maybe along that lines too, one of the questions um, that I was asking was, um, this is in reference to look, using video data to look at gait and, and assess gait disturbances. And in the, we're, we live in a camera culture, right? That uh, uh, we have all this video from security cameras, from, uh, you know, public places and, and, you know, has any of this or have people thought about using this to maybe even screen for neurological diseases? Let's say, you know, the camera that's on every entrance to a hospital or a clinic, right? You could almost screen for people walking in. Um, and the, then the follow-up question is, should we, right? I mean, is that something we should be doing? I don't know if you had thoughts of that. Hey, uh you, know, you, you can identify people even by their gait patterns, uh, even if uh, you know the, the other information is taken away. So there, there is the big privacy issue. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a company that was spun out of MIT called Emerald, and they use Wi-Fi reflections to do motion capture, mm -hmm. including I, I think they've done this now with several people in the room. But uh, theoretically, you know, you could you could set up. Uh, this technology in a nursing home and track people even through walls and watch their walking. And if you have everyone identified and if somebody's gait starting to change, mm. they're a fall risk. And so uh, the physical therapists and some fall risk clinics are starting to use um, connect based camera technologies and some other things, uh, even just, you know, can you do a screen uh, holding a phone with the accelerometers up to your, your chest and see what your balance is like. So uh, J Jake Sosnoff, who used to be uh, at UIUC, is down, down in Kansas now. Uh, he, he was looking into things like that. I see. I think that was the answer to uh, the Max's next question. You know, do you anticipate the technology could predict neurological decline over time and be predictive? Right. So I think, yeah, the, both the camera, the accelerometers, the, the Wi-Fi reflectivity, those seem like that's what they're set up to do. Um, Another question. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not quite this. Having been an engineer and, and my work, my earliest work was in uh, gait and balance and movement and analysis. So over the past 20 years, things have definitely improved with machine learning and capability and vision. Um, I know that early on when I got here, we were trying to do some gate analysis and being able to quantify differences in people's behaviors as a consequence of interventions. And it was actually very difficult. I think as time is going on and as technology is improving in terms of resolution of movement and also machine learning and algorithms, being able to detect them, they're getting better. And you know, Chris is sort of saying there are products that are starting to come out to be able to do these. But the other issue, of course, is taking those quantitative data and then matching them or pairing them to what is the clinical evaluation or, or diagnosis of that individual and creating these larger and larger databases in order to do the appropriate artificial learning, you know, artificial intelligent machine learning algorithms in order to really get to be very good at doing diagnosis and prediction. Mm -hmm. So I think this is still, it's there, it's coming, but it's still out there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think this is a related question that, you know, the technological developments in cranial nerve testing and the, the mini mental exam, uh, it appears that it's, it's going to move this neurological disease screening into the households worldwide, right? So more personalized. And uh, the question is, you know, if, if this, uh, you know, catches diseases earlier in their progression, how do you anticipate this changing the landscape of neurology as a field, right, and how we care for these patients? Um, yes, it will, it will change it a lot. And, you know, uh, following up on, on Liz's uh, 
points that are very well taken. You know, the, this is going to happen in steps and uh, phases for different portions of the neurologic exam and different symptoms that need to be evaluated in different disease conditions. Uh, but uh, it, it will, uh, I think neurologists will have more information to work with. We'll be able to care for more people and hopefully interventions come along too, where we can keep people's quality of life better than it would be otherwise, you know, their trajectory starting to change. Yeah. Can we bump that and flatten it a little bit? Mm -hmm. So, so um, in your opinion, what is being underdiagnosed the most? And is this the underdiagnosis because there's a shortage of neurologists or because the current diagnostics just aren't sensitive enough maybe to pick those up? Hmm. That's a, a great question, and I, I'm not quite sure. You know, some things that happen, uh, you know, somebody has a stroke very suddenly, they're weak on one side of their body, they can't speak. You can get that diagnosis uh, yeah. without doing any testing. Uh, they have great ways with imaging now to look at which vessels are involved. Uh, there, there are so many different fields in neurology. I, I guess you'd have to break this out. One big challenge that's out there is about a third of patients that we see coming into uh, neurology clinics with medical symptoms of physical dysfunction, we can't explain why the person's having those. And, you know, it's, it's a real experience for that, that person, but does it represent a dysfunction of some portion of their nervous system, or is it a reaction to something else? Uh, is there another process going on? We have a tough time sorting that out. And uh, that's, that's a big, uh, it's a big area where healthcare costs are generated and uh, we need to get better at that. I'm not sure if digitized examinations uh, will help with that, but just thinking of things that are underdiagnosed, we see a lot of those people and it's do a lot of testing and then get to that diagnosis. How could we bring that up more quickly, I guess, or identify that more quickly? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, there was a question uh, that wondering if once you have the training simulator perfected, if you could create a device to actually do the testing and then allow non-neurologists to, to do some preliminary or screening testing that way. Where do you think that simulation, to move from simulation to testing? With a tool or? I, I think with the, maybe with the same device, the, the various devices or technologies to actually administer the test. So I'm thinking if you've got, um, if you've created the simulator, you know what needs to be tested and how to test it. So could you do a reverse and create a device that could actually do the testing itself, substitute the physician for a device? And you kind of answered that with the PRVM, where you can collect the data and do some things that way. Yeah, I think part of it is using the PVRM as one way that we're thinking that you could get the quantitative data. And we've talked to some folks at Vanderbilt actually about trying to get into their clinics uh, to have a non neurologist or non specialist using the device to be able to characterize patients. Um, the other is some of our colleagues in China are kind of flipping it around and kind of thinking, can you create a robot that could do the assessment too? So have a robot clinician uh, that could be remote and do these assessments on an individual, or maybe we could do a combination of being able to put sensors on the patient, but also have a robot that can do the movements uh, on the, the individual instead. So I think there are definitely these different things coming around and people thinking about how to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but how to do it less complex because I was proposing to Chris, like, let's build an entire mannequin that can display all of these different characterizations so they can use it for training. He's like, you know what? I don't know if we need an entire mannequin and we could do some of these things in VR and we don't have to do all of this like with a mannequin or a robot. Um, and I was like, okay, fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but it's a good point that, you know, not everything has to be super high tech. You can do different ways of using technologies to help with training and help with assessment. Mm -hmm. yep. So uh, Dr. Rowan points out, we have, you know, medical students here now in our College of Medicine and 
possibly a physical therapy program soon. So, um, you know, she asked, will you be involving local students as well? And, and is there a need in some of your, your studies and, and programs to involve uh, local medical students? Of course. I mean, we, we, you know, I think with the Carl Illinois medical students that are interested in being in, innovators, we're always welcome to have them coming and working with us. And then also in the future, in terms of evaluating uh, the training simulators themselves, being coming to that next stage. So right now, so many of the devices were just getting clinicians to tell us do these even seem right? And once we get that, can we put it into the educational setting and then seeing how it, the, the learners are interacting with the devices? Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, two more questions, it looks like. One more, where does the data for the target trigger strength for these simulations come from? Those Is that in that reference is. to the strength exam simulator or to trigger the catch and release of spasticity. Um, Samantha, if you're on, maybe. Yeah, uh, so my original question was wondering, like for the clonus stuff, like how, where was that from? Like what angle or what position you needed for clonus? So for the clonus, the way we, we designed it in terms of the beats of the frequencies and then the velocities and the torques at which they were being triggered is really from the literature. And uh, again, the literature is rather sparse in all of these topics in terms of quantitative values. And they're also highly variable. Like some studies will say it's a range of such and such frequency of the beat. And then other ones are like, oh no, the frequency <laughs> is over here. And then we're like, what do we program this thing to? You know, but that's the human body too. We know there's huge variability in humans and in different conditions. And the hard part is uh, for all of you is try, as clinicians is sort of categorizing these people in, in these qualitative scales. But maybe it goes more to the quantitative. Uh, so I always like thinking about blood pressure now. That's an example where we're just taking quantitative data. We've got a device that you can do these measurements and now you can, you have these numbers and you can track these numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, question, the voice app seems very exciting. Uh, I think this could be useful, could be helpful in teaching speech patterns. Listen, uh, listening only has to be integrated with direct visual exam. Um, I don't know if, if Christian, if you want to expand on that. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, I, I think just watching uh, an individual as they're speaking and then as you're listening, that's such a complex process. And I, I have 38 years of <clears throat> clinical experience and I, I see patients in the nursing home mostly at this point. And so how do you translate all of this information gathered into something that can be passed on to another person to make a decision? Um, you know, in terms of following patients who've had previous brain injuries, you know, how do you make the decision that, oh, okay, this is probably not a new stroke, but maybe something else is going on metabolically that influences what the nurse sees and they're calling you. So anytime you filter it through one other person, it, it gets real complex because what you what you perceive, what you perceive with your eyes, and you're using your brain to do that, um, is a little bit like communicating. Communication is so complex. What you're saying today, I get a perception of what you've said, but that may not be 100% accurate. And so, um, you know, listening to someone and watching to them at the same time is really valuable. Uh, just the, there's a sad uh, de-emphasis of the clinical exam. Uh, I think there's still much to be said for teaching a good clinical exam, which is hard. It has to be done. We don't have enough time. The clinicians don't have adequate time. But that was one of the concerns I had is how do you connect all these things together to make something that can be useful 
And who is it supposed to be for? Is it for us as physicians gathering data? Does it help people in the nursing home maybe see a, a new situation different from what they had to begin with? Uh, because in the nursing home, when a nurse calls us and we think there's a change in their mentation or change in their speech order, that automatically triggers some evaluation, which is around $10,000 or more. And that's where the healthcare costs go. And so I'm just trying to think in my brain, how do you put this all together and make it useful for the general population? Or what population is this meant for specifically? Does that make any sense? I, th I think there'll be several different users uh, for the, the different technologies. And uh, it's, it's kind of like a crowdsourcing process where all these different uh, research groups are developing out different algorithms, different technologies. Uh, and eventually the healthcare systems uh, and the individual clinician users need to be able to pick and choose which tools are accessible and what works to help solve their questions. I mean, just, just like we do our physical exam to try to test hypotheses, we need to use these digital tools likewise. Uh, and you know, making a navigator for that, that's you know, something that we're, we're trying to sort out. How do we go about that? Because it's, this, the field is just starting out and uh, there's, there's gonna be a big bubbling up of different technologies. Uh, some will stick very well, uh, others will stick for a while, but then get replaced. And how do you keep all those data streams, et cetera? It's a, it's a big challenge. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Well, those were the, the questions in the chat. Let's open this up. If there's anyone here that feel free to unmute yourself and if you have other questions to follow up on. Hi, um, my name is Christian. I had a question about the voice technology. Um, I'm currently on my psychiatry rotation and, and a lot of psychiatry is based on voice and communicating with the patient and whatnot. But I was curious because some pathologies can influence how somebody speaks, not just what they say, but like their tone, their speech, the, the speed of which they talk, whether it's pressured. So I was thinking like in your expert opinion, how do you see this technology playing a role in, in that field or maybe in a patient population with where patients do have a neuro and psych issue, both of them, actually. There are uh, developers working on technologies currently to, for instance, recognize when somebody is starting into a pre-manic or hypomanic state uh, or going into the start of a depression, for instance, uh, not just with what happens with changes in voice, but how they're interacting with their phones, for instance. Uh, so there, there are a lot of, there's a lot of interest in this because it's uh, in, in psychiatry, except for the very acute breaks, and oftentimes it's a little bit of a, a slower change for people. And if we can somehow do an intervention before they become severely depressed, severely manic or severely psychotic, uh, or uh, figure out that, yeah, their anxiety levels going up, all those things would be great. And so I, uh, I don't think it's, ready for prime time, so to speak, but pe people are working on this. Now, I, I attended a, a uh, event up at Matter, the incubator in Chicago a couple of years ago, and there was a woman who was pitching her cell phone app that was already commercialized. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, um, maybe I'd like to just, I've got one um, related to some of the early points you had mentioned, this neurophobia. And, uh, and I recall, you know, going through medical school and thinking about different specialties. And, um, you know, people had said that in neurology, they're somewhat fearful of it because th there aren't as many therapies available, right? That we can diagnose conditions. Um, and this was 30 years ago. Um, but has it changed, right? So what does early intervention matter, right? Early diagnosis, uh, what sort of therapies are out there that could really be helpful early on? Um, are there more coming in that field? 
I, I would say, yes, there are a lot of different puzzles in neurology, but the molecular tools to start to create treatments and identifying what are the targets that uh, need to be treated uh, are being identified uh, more and more rapidly than compared to 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, stroke, uh, just that has markedly changed compared to 30 years ago. So you have somebody who comes in completely hemiplegic and they're going up and taking out the clot now and they're discharging them the next day. It's yeah. completely amazing. Uh, the other end uh, for spinal muscular atrophy, uh, people now uh, can get therapies for that uh, to either slow it down uh, or mm -hmm. try to arrest it. And mm -hmm. uh, now that the research groups are trying to target different genes, exon skipping, et cetera, to prevent diseases from even happening. So you identify that the person has a genetic mutation that's going to cause a disease, but let's find a, a compound that allows a normal expression uh, of the protein or at least partial expression and fix the problem. So yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Um, neurology in 30 years are going to be looking back at us thinking we were barbaric. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's great to hear. Well, uh, thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Zalek, Dr. Sal Wexler. This has really been a, a great discussion and, and presentation and, and a glimpse of what's coming uh, as well. Uh, before we all break here, uh, I, I did just want to, I put in the, the chat a link uh, about Innovation Week. And so I want to remind um, the students, everybody that's on this call that uh, uh, next week is going to be a really exciting time uh, for our college. Uh, we have starting on Wednesday, this, this, the winners of the COZED New Venture Challenge are going to be announced. Uh, this is uh, really a campus-wide uh, innovation challenge, and many of our medical students have been involved uh, in some of those teams. On Thursday evening, we have an innovation symposium, an idea symposium. So uh, for our students in our idea projects course, uh, this is uh, something perhaps next year you can participate in. Um, by sharing your ideas to a larger public audience. Uh, and then Friday, of course, is our all-day innovation, uh, health innovation research day. And, and many students are participating in that as well as residents and, and fellows and, and students from the UI College of Medicine. So that's an all-day event. Uh, and then finally on Saturday is our large health makeathon. So uh, just really a whole series of uh, events next week that celebrate uh, medical innovation. All these can be accessed off of our, uh, the, uh, the college website under Innovation Week. So be sure and check those out, register for those, and uh, I think we'll have a lot to, to see next week as well. So thank you all for joining us uh, and uh, spending the last hour and a half or so with us. Thank you again to our speakers, um, and uh, we wish you all a good day. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.